Good morning to all. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Hill Country in Kerrville, Texas. We are glad that all of you have joined us, including our visitors today. That's really special for us. And for those who may visit us later on uh, our YouTube sites, then uh, welcome to you as well. I'm Mike Burkett, and I'll be your service associate. Now, take a deep breath. Come into this circle of love and justice. Come into this community where we can dream or even better believe in those dreams. Come into this communal space where we can remember who we are and what we want to be. Come now, let us worship together. Art. I think this should be a uh, Unitarian Universalist hymn by the wonderful singer Iris Demet. Oh, everybody is wondering what and where they all came from. And everybody is worried about where they're going to go when the whole thing's done. Well, no one knows for certain, so it's all Think I'll just let the mystery be. Some say once you're gone, you're gone forever. Some say you're gonna come back. Some say you rest in the arms of the Savior. If in sinful ways you lie. Some say they're coming back in the garden, bunch of carrots and little sweet peas. Think I'll just let the mystery be. Oh, everybody is wondering what and where they all came from. Everybody is worried about where they're going to go and the whole thing done. Well, no, no, so and it's all the same to me. Think I'll just let the mystery be. Well, some say they're going to a place called glory, and I ain't saying that in the back. But I've heard I'm on the road to purgatory, and I don't like the sound. Well, I believe in love, and I live my life accordingly, but I choose to let the mystery be. Thank you. If anyone has an announcement, uh, wave your hand, and uh, Justin will uh, unmute you and put you in, or uh, what is it? Do a Zoom chat message to Justin, one or the other. So, anyone have announcements? Okay, uh, let me get to Linda first. Let's see. Vicki was raising her hand, let her announce. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to remind everyone that we will have a very brief congregational meeting after this, and I hope that our members would stay. Uh, of course, our guests are welcome to stay as well, but uh, we really need a few members to stay very brief after the service. So thank you all for showing up today. Nice to see all your faces. Thank you, Justin. You're welcome. All right, and just a second, Jill, I'm getting to you here. You're not under your usual name, so I have to find you in the list. <laughs> well, how that happened, I have no idea why we're Chloe today. 
Um, this could be either an announcement or a joy, but uh, for those of you who are fans of Camerata San Antonio, they are, if you uh, buy a subscription, they will send you a link to their currently doing online concerts. And there's one this afternoon at three. And then when they start going into live concerts, only people with subscriptions will be invited to buy tickets so that they can limit the audience. So if you're a fan of San Antonio, Camerata San Antonio, I recommend you look into this. And also for those of you who are fans of The Princess Bride, you may already know about this, but there's a, a live table reading with the original cast this, this evening at six uh, to benefit the Wisconsin Democratic race. So if you support Wisconsin Democrats, <laughs> or if you just want to hear The Princess Bride, uh, look into that as well. It's a fun day online. All right. Vicki, you're back on. Uh, well, that, that urged me on to say a word for Lyle Lovett. Uh, it's kind of the best of both worlds between Camerata and Lyle Lovett. But he's doing a, a, a streaming concert on September 18th with the same idea. If you buy a talk, uh, ticket, they'll send you a link. And how could we not love Lyle Lovett? So another announcement. September 18th. All right. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Uh, Art, go ahead. I had lunch with Lyle Lovett in Santa Fe a couple of months ago. Oh, well, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're, in, we're in Santa Fe, and, and I happened to see him at a table, and so I went up and introduced myself and asked to take his picture. And and he, very graciously, I, I told him I, I had seen his uh, – concert at the Majestic in San Antonio right. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. a year ago. And, and it, it was like a revival. I, I mean, it was just, it was very spiritual. <laughs> yeah. and, and I told him that. And I said I was a retired minister, a Unitarian minister. And he said, oh, I have some retired, I have some Unitarian friends, which was very exciting to me. Um, and, and he said, but he said, I, I'd rather not take a picture. He said, but I wouldn't mind if my friend took a picture of me and you. And so I said, oh, and so I had some pictures taken with he and I together. And he was very gracious and very nice. And, and then I went back and sat down. And, and so I like to say I had lunch with him because we ate in the same restaurant. <laughs> Just, sorry, simple brag. <laughs> Name drop. <laughs> All right, anybody else? All right. All right, a brief reminder, uh, our expenses continue even though we are meeting online and not at the sanctuary. Uh, if you could drop off your donations at 960 Barnett, either through the slot in the door or just mail it, uh, it would be appreciated. Thank you. Okay, at this time, let us light our chalice. And as we light our chalice today, let us remember that we're part of a great community of faith. May this dancing flame inspire us to fill our lives with the heat and passion to instill and inspire love, justice, and truth on this planet. As in... Uh, Many Unitarian Universalist services, we set aside some time to share joys and concerns. We find that a joy shared is a joy increased and a concern that is shared finds a place for support. So if anyone has one, either send it to Justin on the chat line or raise your hands. Justin will now be posting on the screen uh, our church mission statement, and then he will follow with our church affirmation. And if you would join with me. Okay, we're going to do the nope, affirmation. Nope. There's the mission. We're going to do the mission. <laughs> it jumped on me. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> You'll join with me, and let's, uh, let's say this in unison. We journey together, together, guided by UU values, values to, to seek, to seek nurture, nurture, and serve. serve our loving church family, our community, and our world. The doctrine of this church is love. The quest of truth is its sacrament, 
and, and service, service is, is its, its prayer. prayer. And this, this is, is our great covenant, covenant to dwell to together in peace, peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, 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 to serve so humanity in fellowship, as we strive to have all souls grow into harmony with the divine. Art? This is a, probably my favorite gospel hymn. Um, I have sung this for, well, I think since I was seven years old. Oh, I come to the garden alone while the do still on the roses and the voice I hear calling on my ear the son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own As ever known, he speaks the sound of his voice. Is so sweet, first hush the singing, and the melody that he gave to me was in my heart. Sometime I'd like to do a sermon just on people's reaction to that song. The reading is uh, from both the, well, from the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology, um, from an old sermon, and from a wonderful book of old times called The Road Less Traveled by Scott Peck. From Journal of Transpersonal Psychology, an article called Avoiding the Void, the Lack of Self in Psychotherapy in Buddhism by David Lloyd, that according to one of the great psychological figures, Lloyd says, Otto Rank, contemporary humanity is neurotic because while we still suffer from a consciousness of sin, as did our ancestors, we don't believe in the religious concept of forgiveness of sin or the rituals to absolve sin so that we are left with no way of being forgiven. We are, that is, oppressed by the realization that the burden of guilt is unpayable." End quote. Now the reading from an old sermon. And so what is happening in our country is a societal and religious schizophrenia 
On the one hand, we have the Orthodox or fundamentalist churches growing by leaps and bounds, but those churches don't trust psychotherapy, science, or art, or literature, and not only do they seem to operate under a different reality when they use religious terms and beliefs which defy, defy logic and even scientific knowledge. And then on the other hand, we have not only the estimated millions of people who have undergone or who are in some sort of psychotherapy, but according to a 1990 newspaper report, 15 million people in over 200 types of 12-step recovery going to a half a million meetings across the country each week. The 12-step programs have become an interfaith church unto themselves, blurring any distinction between psychology and theology. And then there's the phenomenon of psychiatrist and best-selling author Scott Peck who personifies the twinning of psychology and religion with his wonderful book, The Road Less Traveled. And if you never read it when it became popular, find it in um, half price bookstores and read it. It's still wonderful, which he subtitles, A New Psychology of Love, Traditional Values and Spiritual Growth. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for an incredible 10 consecutive years. The publisher described it back then by saying that it integrates traditional psychology, psychological, and spiritual insights. The result is a book that can show you how to embrace reality and achieve serenity and fullness in your life, end quote, and I fully agree. Peck says that he makes no distinction between the mind and the spirit, and quote, there is no distinction between the process of achieving spiritual growth and achieving mental growth, end quote. And he even defines love in religious terms. Quote, the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth, end quote. And he says also there is no such thing as a good hand-me-down religion. And the next, I think we should have over our church doors, the path to holiness lies in questioning everything, end quote. The unbelievable popularity of Peck's books means that millions of people were looking for answers outside traditional religion, blending psychology and theology, perhaps even becoming Unitarian Universalists without knowing it. And the 12-step programs continue to become the fastest growing blend of religion and psychology. So take a breath and pause. Think about your reaction to that song in the garden. So, the psychology of religion. Is God the placebo or the belief? Isaac Asimov, the great humanist and science fiction writer, liked to tell this story. Mrs. Moskowitz was bursting with pride talking to her friend, Mrs. Finkelstein, and said, did you hear about my son, Louis? Mrs. Finkelstein says, no, what is it about your son, Louis? Well, he's going to a psychiatrist. Twice a week, he's going to a psychiatrist. Is that good or what? Well, what do you mean he's good? What? How is it good? Well, she says, of course it's good. $150 an hour, $150 an hour, and all he talks about is me. <laughs> Speaking of mothers, Sigmund Freud, of course, how can we think of anything else when we're talking about mothers? You know what a Freudian slip is. It's when you say one thing, but you mean your mother. <laughs> well, Sigmund Freud was on the cover of Time Magazine some years ago with the question on that black background, is Freud dead? It's hard not to believe that that was the uh, description of the similar, similar cover line of years before as it is forever and ever shall be the most famous cover line in time annals consisted of the April 1966 cover, Is God Dead? And it also reminded me of that famous t-shirt, which said, God is dead, Nietzsche, and underneath said, Nietzsche is dead, God. <laughs> well, both Freud 
and God are frequently seen as the archetypes of authority. One in psychology, the other, of course, religion or theology. And both seem to dislike the questioning of their authority or knowledge by others. Yahweh himself handling, handing down those new commandments and Freud, the Yahweh handing down the commandments called psychoanalysis. His most beloved student, Carl Jung, whose father had been a Lutheran minister, finally questioning Freud and was thrown out or break, broke away and started his own form of psychology, one grounded in a liberal Protestant religion, spirituality and even mythology. Indeed, carved in stone, if you see the symbolism there, over Jung's front door were these words in Latin, which meant called or not, the gods will be present. Something else that we might put over our church doors. Did you know, for instance, it was a Unitarian who invented the first course on psychology of religion? It was William James, of course, and that first course was in Harvard. Back in 1902, the book that he wrote, which became a huge bestseller and is still printed on a regular basis, still avidly read, and I would still recommend, titled The Varieties of Religious Experience. So let's back up a little bit and start with some definitions, though we have some familiar words, most of which you might say need no definition. Words like religion, God, psychology, but not everyone may know what a placebo is. Religion, you might ask, certainly everyone knows what that word means. But if you were to take a course of psychology or comparative religion, you would probably start the course by being asked to define it. And in a way to cover all religions, you see. And you might not be able to use the word God in that definition because not all religions have a concept of God, like Buddhism, for instance. And keep further in mind that they estimate there might be as many as 10,000 religions when we include all folk religions and other religions of ancient times in the world. Now, try to get your head around that thought, that there might be as many as 10,000 religions. Now come up with a definition that would satisfy this. Or another easy one, define the word God. We all know what that means, don't we? It used to be said that about 90% of Americans believe in God, or say they do. But I always found that number suspect. First of all, is the obvious question, which God? And like I always say, what do they mean by believe in God? I thought a lot of people were probably just being polite or perhaps socially acceptable, maybe, maybe even hedging their bets. By socially acceptable, I mean the response one gets when one says they don't believe in God, and most of us probably have been in that social circle when they say something like that among a group of people, in Kerrville, for instance, when you say you believe in peace. <laughs> it's, it's something similar to that. You know, when, when you're uh, in a group of conservatives and you say something like that. Well, you might like to know the latest surveys have become more politically correct. And now 90% of Americans say they believe in some kind of higher power. And only 50%, 56% say they believe in the God of the Bible. Uh, again, we can still say which God of the Bible, but that's beside the point. And the conservatives get really upset because that's down from 73% who said they believed in the Bible God back in 1991. Now, psychology, another easy one, but as you can imagine, those words require books to start with. Well, so let's start with the word religion and we'll go through some definitions. We first start, of course, by the authority and that is Google. So we Google it, we get to dictionary.com and here's one but definition a set of beliefs concerning cause, nature, and purpose of the universe, 
especially when considered as the creation of a superhuman agency or agencies usually involving devotional and ritual observances and often concerning or containing a moral code governing the conduct of human affairs. Religion is a social cultural system of behaviors designated and practices, moral, morals, worldviews, texts, sanctified places, prophecies, ethics, or organizations that relates humanity to supernatural, transcendental, or spiritual elements. And then the last sentence, which perhaps <laughs> is most important. However, there is no scholarly consensus over what precisely constitutes a religion, end quote. And I find that the most interesting. In other words, nobody really knows what religion is. And in fact, word religion is a relatively recent use and has no meaning in most ancient cultures and in many recent cultures. Native Americans, for instance, have no word for religion because for them it is not something separate from their daily lives. The closest word in ancient cultures, including the Bible, for religion is something like the word law. There is no original word in the Bible for religion. Does that blow your mind or what? Think about that for a minute. The word religare, which we usually think of as the root, means a binding together, which can be either negative or positive. What do you think about that? Freud, for instance, thought religion was a neurosis. And here we start to mix psychology and religion, because he describes religious beliefs as illusions, fulfillment of the oldest, strongest, and urgent wishes of mankind. Interestingly, however, he always described himself as a Jew. He never stopped being a Jew, although obviously not a believer, and of course had to flee from Hitler, who was trying to eliminate the Jews. But early in my studies of him, I, I found him cold, authoritarian, and a fundamentalist atheist. And we have known, we do know fundamentalist atheists even in our midst. And I always say, I, I try to convert all of those atheists into becoming agnostics. In other words, it's a way to open people's minds. The fundamentalist atheist, to me, has a closed mind. Not, not all atheists, mind you but it's that fundamentalist atheist which is not willing to even search, you see. Jung, however, who broke with Freud primarily because of his fundamentalists, is a different kind of person. He was more mystical and spiritual and certainly not a traditional Christian. Indeed, part of the interesting part about his biography is reading about his discussions with his Lutheran pastor father and the questioning of traditional Christian Christian theology, and the ironic part where his father tried to explain things like the Trinity to him and would stumble over explanations and finally just said, well, let's not talk about it because I really don't understand it either. And it was at that point where Jung had this epiphany, if you will pardon the pun, that Christianity is not understandable when you come to the creeds. And it was because they don't make sense. Jung says, since religion is incontestably one of the earliest and most universal human activities of the human mind, it is self-evident that any kind of psychology which touches upon the psychological structure of human personality cannot avoid at least observing the fact that religion is not only a sociological historical phenomenon, but also something of a considerable personal concern to a great number of individuals, end quote. So psychology is not, considered, is not concerned with facts or judgments about the motives of such things as the Trinity or virgin birth or resurrection. It is only concerned with the fact that there is an idea of those things, not whether they are true or false. Because religion appeared to Jung to be, quote, a pe peculiar attitude of the human mind, which could be formulated in accordance with the original term religion. 
That is, a careful consideration and observation of certain dynamic factors understood to be powers, spirits, demons, gods, laws, ideals, or whatever names man has given or humanity has given to such factors as one has found in one's world, powerful, dangerous, or helpful enough to be taken into careful consideration or grand, beautiful, and meaningful enough to be devoutly adored and loved, end quote. In a book titled, Why God Won't Go Away, Brain Science and the Biology of Belief, Andrew Newberg and others write, what is important is that all human beings have the longing and the capacity for, correct, for connection, and that connection is available everywhere, in church, in music, in art. In fact, many of the religious rituals we engage in, such as chanting, drumming, dancing, or moving in a rhythmic fashion, mimic the complex reaction of our brains to mystical experiences. Given how good spiritual and religious practices make us feel, and the growing body of medical evidence showing that they cut down on stress, improve the immune system, lower blood pressure, and actually add years to our lives, it is no coincidence that we have evolved to be hardwired for God, so to speak, end quote. And I would say for religion or for a beloved community. The psychology of religion is vastly different for Freud, for instance, than it is for Jung, than it is for this material that is relatively recent. So for instance, we must realize that we all bring our own quote baggage, our own subjectivity, our own opinions, our own experiences to how we view, think, or feel, experience religion. Or gospel songs like in the garden. And yes, especially, when we use any of the religious code words, and especially that troublesome word, God, or even spirituality. I have had you use come up to me after I preach a sermon on spirituality, for instance, or even talk about it, and ask or perhaps demand that I um, define spirituality, and whenever they say that, I know I'm being challenged. I'm not being asked for a definition, I'm being challenged. And I usually wait and, and ask them a little bit more about it. It's like being asked whether or not I believe in God. That usually is a, a question that has more to do with the agenda of the person asking it than it does actually in wondering about my definition. And I'll go more into defining God <clears throat> um, because I, I'm not going to try to define it uh, simply using the very understandable Judeo-Christian Muslim, Muslim concepts found in the sacred scriptures. Indeed, all three uh, religions are called religions of the book because they are based on holy scriptures. And the concepts and understanding beliefs and rules of God in those scriptures are not consistent, nor are they clear to people outside of those scriptures. Hence the seeming need, not only for three different religions, but then the corresponding endless sects within each of those three religions, and the willingness to kill anybody who disagrees within those groups. Amen. So move, uh, moving on, let's add the idea of the placebo. Placebos, uh, I quote here, are lies that heal, says Dr. Ann Harrington, uh, a scientist at Harvard University. Uh, a placebo is a sham treatment that a doctor gives out merely to please or placate a patient. It's also a make-believe drug. It has no medical properties, and it's used in some cases in trials for other drugs. You, you give the real drug and you give a placebo to a bunch of people to find out whether the real drug is working. The problem is <laughs> with those treatments sometimes, when you give a placebo and a person think it's the real drug, it can also work as well as the real drug because your body can be fooled into thinking that it's the real drug. And if you are, giving, if you are given a little white tablet 
it's much more, a little white tablet as a placebo, it's much more effective than a big red capsule. Now, now figure that one out. Your mind is fooled more by a little white capsule. So that's how good placebos are. So caution here, faith healing can work because faith healing is basically a placebo. Does God do it? Or does the placebo do it? Science is now showing how our own bodies can be tricked by placebos. Think about that. We've all known that a loving kiss by our mother when we skin our knee can take away the pain. A loving religious community can help our brains and hearts and bodies heal and find strength, even if it can't always save us from that monster called cancer or even COVID, but it can always comfort us. Religion, after all, used to be the psychology. And when I describe my theology, as ministers always seem required to do, as a mystical humanist on the cusp of naturalistic theism or Emersonian transcendentalism, but basically a religious searcher for meaning, that makes sense to some people and not others. There is a similarity in psychology and religion between a priest, minister, rabbi, cantor, shaman, oracle, seer, sage, witch, wizard, medicine man, woman, medical doctor, chiropractor, therapist, and psychiatrist. Indeed, the psychotherapist and writer Sheldon Kopp, in his wonderful book, If You Meet the Buddha on the Road, Kill Him, on the blend of psychology and Eastern religion, says the search for enlightenment pursued in a secular context by today's psychotherapy patient has in the past been cast in religious terms. Whatever the metaphors in which the pilgrim experiences his or her quest, any trip involving a search for spiritual meaning is an allegorical journey through life, a journey that can renew and enrich the quality of the rest of the pilgrim's daily living. You've heard some people call religion a crutch, and maybe I'm suggesting it's a placebo, but people's beliefs are powerful. And if they are not harmful or hurtful, maybe we shouldn't be so quick to criticize them. But notice that modifier. Believe in prayer, but make sure you see a doctor as well. See a doctor, but take the medicine and think positive thoughts and relax and find a loving religious community as well. You know, I've been going to church all my life until college when my spiritual journey took me away from traditional Christianity into the counterculture where I found it within my friends and music and reading and learning and exploring. During young adulthood, I became a UU without knowing it and therefore became because Unitarian Universalism kind of keeps itself an intellectual elitist secret sometimes, don't we? During college, I was invited to two different kinds of religious experiences. One, a UU fellowship, which I remember now as made up of mostly old people, mostly boring, though the good thing was that they were anti-Vietnam at the time, but I found nothing religious or spiritual about it, and so therefore never visited another UU place for oh, 30 years. I had a number of Quaker friends. I was in Southeast Pennsylvania, and they invited me to a Quaker meeting, and there again, I found a bunch of old people. <laughs> I can say that now. I found a bunch of old people, uh, but again, there was no music. It was very quiet, long periods of silence, and I found it boring, and I never went to another Quaker meeting. But the two churches I grew up in, one a small country church, which was a combination of Baptist and Congregational, and after we moved to a larger place, we went to the Congregational UCC Church, were both very spiritual experiences for me when I was younger. And I have fond memories of that Christian experience until my journey led me away. Because for me, religion is about the spirit and the spiritual of the gathered community and my journey of life with others who are part of my life and love. I felt called to ministry by God. And I believed that God called me. I was sitting in that congregational church in Laconia, New Hampshire, around 1960. I think it was in about sixth grade. It was with my family. Now, I no longer believe in that kind of God who has a voice to call me. And 
Yet here I am, a minister, some 60 years later, preaching to you. Was that calling a placebo? Was it just a feeling? Does it matter? Hell, for me, would be no religion, no one. No friends or family, no beloved community, no spirit of life anywhere around me. I have found a loving meaning in my life, which I call religious, serving the spirit of love, who or which some call God. No one knows whether God or love exists as a fact. Is love a placebo? Is hope? God, I hope not. I sometimes substitute the word love for God, and I believe in love. And I have a wife of 47 years, three daughters, and five grandchildren, and many friends to prove it. May it be so for all of you. Amen. Let's go Thank you, Art. Now we'll have our talk back. So if you would, raise your hand and uh, Justin will call on you and let you speak to us or to Art or both at the same time. And Vicki's hand shot right up. So I've got you on now, Vicki. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Art. That was everything you uh, use sermon is cracked up to be. <laughs> um, I'm very intrigued, and this was a, a new uh, insight for me on the phrase beloved community, and particularly um, listening to you and thinking about the, ex the experience of beloved community and what that means in terms of our seemingly universal longing for connection. So my question is this. Uh, do you see all types and varieties of spiritual practice to be at the base seeking connection? Is that what spiritual practice is about? Or at least is that one way to look at it? I'd be very interested in your thoughts on that. <clears throat> Let's say I hope so. Um, <laughs> I think... I think what I find is um, since I think, well, what I find is my reading, I, I, I say that my search for that in, in my spiritual practices uh, have a, what I call a golden thread. And that is that I will, I will read a book and, and if it moves me spiritually, almost always, it leads me to another book. Oh. And that's the, that's the golden thread. Now that, that book might be from <laughs> science fiction. It might be an Isaac Asimov book that has moved me spiritually. Um, and, and it might just be that if it's not that book, it might be the person that recommended that book recommends another one. Um, but I, I know in many cases, uh, I think of, um, you know, the, the, the books that I continue to read, you know, varieties of religious experiences is, is a good, uh, good, good example. I, I mean, here's a book from 1902 that was incredible. And, and one of those books that I find was a turning point, um, you know, Scott Peck's book, um, The Road Less Traveled. Um, I, I remember, uh, I, <laughs> I read that while I, I was literally, I was working in a, in a psychiatric hospital um, as a counselor. And I, I went to a, uh, I went to a, um, it was a psychological association meeting in Philadelphia, which is near where I live, so I could go to it. And it was on psychology and spirituality. And it, they were all surprised because it was the largest attended um, association meeting that they'd had in a long time. And they were surprised because they didn't think it would, you know, get anybody. Um, and so there was a, a, you know, a psychological group, very secular. 
And the, the psychiatric hospital I worked in, was it was a private hospital and they were, uh, very, again, very secular. And I started a men's group and, and they knew I was a seminary student, but they also knew I was Unitarian. So they would often come to me uh, because some of the patients, of course, would have these delusional drawings and they, they would ask me to, you know, for some of the symbolism. Um, so, you know, it, I mean, I think this spirituality is that I would find myself <clears throat> reading in all different religions, but they were, they were ones that, that I found open to universal ideas. So it wasn't that, you know, they were all the same, but, um, and then in other times, somebody would uh, recommend a book and I would try to read it and I would just find it very closed. So it was like, even in the early, in the early Protestant books, uh, in the early German books, for instance, uh, I'll give you an example. <laughs> um, Friedrich Schleiermacher, um, was it Notes to Religious Despiser, I think we had to read in seminary. And I was, I was groaning when we were first assigned to it because I, I, I knew it was going to be terrible. And it turned out it could have been written for a Unitarian seminary because it was one of those that was questioning things. And then we had to read something about Calvin and he said, you know, he came off like this very fundamentalist and I, I could barely get through it. So here were these two Germans around the same time, but entirely different. So with Calvin spirituality, um, was there anything wrong with it? No, but for me, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't see anything in it. So um, instead of saying that, you know, Calvin was bad, Schleiermark was good, it's, it's more like, depends on where you are. And that's what I was trying to say in that. Um, so to me, the, the fundamentalist churches, the danger in them uh, is that they, they lead to divisions and to me, to prejudice, et cetera. Um, and so to me, it's, I find them dangerous. Um, and and that's, that's my fear of fundamentalism. So that kind of spirituality is very different. Um, but among religions, I, I think, um, you know, it's not that a religion is good or bad, or, you know, you should stay away from one religion. It's more like read it, find out how you respond to it. Um, and so what, what I have found is that uh, I, I have found writers in all religions who are very inspiring. All right, Julio, let me get you up here. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Well, first of all, let me say that uh, I jumped at the opportunity of hearing art again, because I must say that the first UU Church of San Antonio was my home congregation. And one of the things that kept me coming back every Sunday, I must tell you honestly, was art, severance sermons. Thank you. Uh, I, and I say this without uh, unequivocally, that I've heard many, many UU ministers, wonderful preachers, but nobody brings together all these elements as art does. Okay, Dang. I just have to say that, okay? I miss you folks. <laughs> I know. Let me continue by saying that I was particularly moved by the song that you sang, because we used to sing the song in the Seventh-day Adventist church where I grew up. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't believe I would hear it from a UU minister. <laughs> it's like, well, let me just say that my background is anthropology and very much influence, influence in my thinking by Carl Jung and also by Joseph Campbell. You know, yeah. you're familiar with that. Yeah. And here's, here's my comment and or question, okay? Um, if we are to, and this is my conclusion, you know, obviously I'm, I'm basing myself on the fourth principle, the fourth principle of the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And um, I have to say that I've always wondered, um, why is it, if we are going to come to the conclusion that the God of the Bible is a myth, let's say that we come to that conclusion, right? And that, and that if, if the creation is a myth and everything that we know is, is mythology in terms of the creation of the world and humanity, et cetera, et cetera, and we accept that the God of the Bible is a myth, then it forces us to make comparisons. For example, why is it that the ancient Hebrews had a pantheon that was all male. Whereas every other culture, and I know this from anthropology, 
as simple as it is or as complex as it is, every other civilization had gods and goddesses. Why is it that only in the ancient Hebrew tradition do you have an all masculine divinity and pantheon? And what does that mean for these patriarchal religions that were based upon that belief? That's my question. That's my question. Comments. And my comment. Good question. <laughs> um, I think it's a, more of a, uh, you know, I, I think, it, it, I mean, it, it's basically the, the problem of the patriarchy um, and, and just the development of, of, that partic of those particular cultures. Um, what, what you will find, again, with, with the work of Joseph Campbell and others is that you will see some of the feminine coming out um, and you will find that in some of, for instance, especially in Catholicism, uh, and, and especially as, um, as it comes into the Americas and, and the Hispanic element and, and the Incan and Aztec element, et cetera, where uh, Mary, uh, for instance, um, becomes more and more important in Catholicism. Um, and um, you, you find her becoming as important. She, be, she becomes a fourth element in the Trinity in many ways, okay? Um, and, and so, you know, we see that happening. I think basically it's just the patriarch. And so there are, there are other religions that are patriarchal and, and some that are matriarchal. Um, and so I, I, I'm not sure... You know, I, I'm not sure there is a reason that that happened, okay, other than human development, uh, where patriarchy was, it probably anthropologically, it would be more, um, it would be more reasonable for you to answer that question than theologically, okay? Um, so between the, theolog theology, mythology, and anthropology, we, we could get our heads together, maybe you can come up with it. Um, but I, I, to me, the interesting part is not why it started that way, but what's happened since then. And I, I've always been fascinated when I first came down here to see the influence, the Spanish influence on uh, Christianity and, and the myths of uh, the spirit of uh, the, the, uh, Guadalupe, for instance, and the Lady of the Lake and, and all of these things that was like, my God, where did these come from? you know, coming down from, you know, a culture that has nothing like this, it's kind of like, you know, the Virgin Guadalupe has nothing to do with Mary. Come on. Who's, who's kidding who? And same thing with Our Lady of the Lake. That sounds like an Arthurian legend. And, you know, and so all of these things where, and then the Catholic Church decides that Mary can be a co-redemptrix. You know, that means she's almost as powerful as God and, you know, the, the number of words in Hebrew that are feminine that become almost as possible as di divine. Um, the, if you remember the story of Lilith, <laughs> you know, and these, uh, you know, these other things, both in Judaism and in Christianity. Um, so there's all of these powerful feminine images that come, okay? Um, and, and so you, you see that coming up. And even in Islam, I, I remember we, uh, Kathy and I were, took that trip to uh, Turkey, sponsored by uh, Fethullah Gulen's group, okay? Uh, and I can remember going through uh, with uh, the two students who used to come to church quite a bit. Uh, they were from uh, U UTSA. And <laughs> we went to, was it, I think it was Ephesus. Yeah. Well, th there was that, yeah, but, but we went to Ephesus and, and, uh, we, and that was really strange to walk in the streets of Ephesus. But Ephesus was also home to the 12 breasted goddess. And I, I can remember asking questions about that and seeing all of these, um, the mosques with the rounded, you know, and saying to, to the, you know, to the students who are our guides and, and they knew how much I like mythology and symbolism. And I said, um, is it just me or, or do those, all those rounded <laughs> temples remind you of, breasts, you know, <clears throat> oh, no, no, you know, they, they simply could not get their heads around any of that symbolism, you know, 
where, where I could see symbols, et cetera, you know. Um, and so I, I think that's the difference that, that the, the, the feminine uh, comes up in symbolism and in goddesses, et cetera, um, so that, that that is there. Um, I think what happened before the patriarchy took over was that there was that the, the, the feminine there. So uh, again, I think it comes. I, I think it's a very similar thing in, in psychology. I mean, Jung starts getting to it uh, with the feminine and the masculine, but even, even there, it's a struggle. And it's not until really you, you get uh, more women in the field of psychology that, you know, that we get them. Okay, uh, I've got Pat up next and then Carolyn, I'll get to you. Uh, Pat, you're, you're live, go ahead. Um, Art, uh, the thing that resonated most with me in your sermon today was, was a personal thing. You're, as you were floundering around searching for a church, it was because of your need for a community. Uh, and I don't require an answer from you, so I'll just relate a little why. Uh, when I was lived in Des Moines, Iowa, where I lived all of my child-rearing years and, years and all my teaching years, I became unchurched from Lutheranism, mainly because I could never believe in the divinity of Christ. Yeah. I believed in his teachings. From teenage years, I could not believe in the divinity of Christ. And so I was on church for many years. Now, when I married Dave in late, later years, Dave and I, uh, we moved to Colorado, a little town called Buena Vista in the, a mountain town that we dearly loved. Um, I looked for a church because I was in my mid sixties then and I wanted that community back. Yeah. Well, of course, there's no Unitarian church in a town as small as Buena Vista was then. I looked for the most liberal church in town, which was a congregational church. And I started attending. And I attended for two years before I really realized I wanted to be a member. And I talked to Pastor Simonson, our very wise pastor at the time, told him why I could not join for the reason I've given. And he said very wisely, everyone is on their own path. And he changed the vows I had to take to become a member of the church. Wow. wow. And so I was a member there. Yeah. Uh, as long as he was pastor. Yeah. Things, anyway, when we moved here after living in Colorado <laughs> for 11 years, one of the reasons we were attracted to Kerrville, I realized I was, I, by this time I knew I was Unitarian at heart. And there were two churches to choose from in this little town of yeah. Kerrville. Yeah. So here I am and it is the only church where I feel an acceptance and I have my community and I'm very grateful for that. Good, good. yeah. The, and, and what I usually say, and that I didn't say this time, I, I almost always say that the reason we finally found a Unitarian Fellowship was that a friend invited us. And, and you know, one of my um, things is that, you know, we, we always are proud that we're, we're not proselytizers. I think we should be, uh, you know. Um, it's not that you have to be a Unitarian to be saved, obviously. But I think your story and my story and so many of our stories is that, 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 you know, we once were lost, you know, and why were we lost? Because we either didn't know a church existed uh, or there was no church. And you wonder, even in that small town, you know, were there, were there six other people or eight other people that might have felt the same, you know, um, and it was because a friend of my, a friend of ours who said, you know, I think you'd like this fellowship. And it was a small fellowship, you know, at that time. Um, and, you know, I mean, it obviously changed our lives because I then went on to become a Unitarian minister. That, you know, that made sense. Um, so I, I think in many cases what happens is that we keep ourselves such a secret. 
I think some of it is is somewhat a fear too, depending on our situation. Where you know <laughs> we don't we don't want to make ourselves too obviously because uh, sometimes of the community we're in, you know. Um, but yes, I, I think that's the thing. We we the two churches that I grew up in, uh, the first one more conservative, but at that time that was fine for us. You know, it was in the fifties. Everybody was, you know, it's kind of like everybody was the same. Uh, you know, I say that it was New Hampshire, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you know. Um, I remember singing in the garden, a lot of Baptists there. I, I, I was debating on whether or not to sing Old Rugged Cross, because that's another <laughs> song. I, I love this. But I, I, I wasn't sure whether you folks were ready for that. So I, I might sing that sometime. But, um, but that's a song I remember singing, and I used to love that song. You know, and it, it obviously not for the theology, but because of how it made me feel. Yeah. The same thing with In the Garden. Um, one time at the church in San Antonio, I said, I, I want, I want, we're, you know, we were, I said, I want to sing In the Garden, but I, I want to change the pronoun. And I want you to think of it as um, your mother in the garden. Because I said, you know, my, my mother has been dead for a while. And to me, in the garden, it's almost like a love song, you know, when you think of it. And, and it is. And it's that idea of someone you love dearly. And boy, I can't think of anyone I'd like to be in the garden with more than my mother. And, and how comforting that would be for me to be in the garden with my mother, for her to comfort me. You know what I mean? And for so many of us, obviously, it doesn't have to be your mother. But, you know, but think of the person you would most like to be in the garden with who would comfort you. And so and I said, in this case, let's change the pronoun to she. And we sang it in, in <clears throat> the church, which is, you know, which is a large church. And, you know, the roof just went off. You know, everybody was singing. Well, I'm sure there was some who didn't. But, you know, we sang. <laughs> and it, it was amazing to me afterwards how many people came up to me and said, oh, thank you so much for letting us sing that. You know, it brought back such good memories. No one, no one complained. I, I was really surprised. All right, Carolyn, go ahead. Am I? <laughs> Whoop, oh, hang on, I got to unmute you again. Okay, thank you for coming back to the feminine. Ah, yes. Because I want to take you back 30,000 years <laughs> before Islam and Judaism and certainly Christianity to the Earth Mother, okay, the Venus of Wellendorf. Yeah. And we had discovered in our travels Venuses all over the world in Turkey and in Malta and all. In fact, it was a competition. My Venus is, is better than your Venus. <laughs> but my Venus is bigger than your Venus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and these were the original idols and goddesses, the earth mothers, okay? Yeah. And yeah. no wonder the domes look like breasts and so on, because right. they were there from the beginning. And somebody said, well, we couldn't figure this out, <laughs> why? And then somebody said it was before men figured out that they had anything to do with reproduction and birth. Yeah. <laughs> it was before they realized their role in it. And once they realized it, it was, you know, all she wrote for us. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And uh, Jill, let me get you on one second here. Go ahead. All right. Just to uh, go back to the idea of the garden and the mother. As soon as you started singing, I was back in my old Presbyterian church. I was 12 years old, and my mother loved that hymn. And I was kind of expecting the old rugged cross next. Yeah. My was a devout Christian. She had, she was a generic Protestant. She wasn't, we yeah. were Church of England when we came to this country. A Presbyterian church sponsored us. <laughs> when she moved to Florida, she became a Methodist. Yeah. And she always had the framed Salmon's head of Christ yep. on her wall wherever she lived. So yep. but thank you for that hymn. I think it was resonant for a lot of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting in, 
for what they call the mainline Protestant, which is Presbyterian, Episcopal, Methodist, UCC, um, et cetera, um, most of those people um, would not know the difference between the churches, okay? Like, I don't know how many of you people could tell me the difference between a Methodist and a, and a Presbyterian as far as the church service or the theology, et cetera. Uh, very few people could. I can't. Um, I mean, I, I can tell you the difference between the origins, you know. Uh, I can tell you the difference between the founders, but for today's service, um, you know, the diff now, the UCC is, is the most liberal of those Protestant groups, um, but that said, it depends on the church and the minister, the state, the variety, et cetera. Um, so I, I think that's one of the differences. Now, you get to the more conservative ones, like the Baptists, and then it, it becomes different. But even among the Baptists, there are, I think there are something like, um, there, are, there are hundreds of different kinds of Baptist churches. And then there are uh, another couple of hundreds of different kinds of Protestant denominations after that. So, you know, it, it gets to be very confusing. All right. Anybody else? I, I wanted to add on one thing to what Julio had said about art and what a joy it is to have him speaking with us. My wife and I had have discussed this after hearing you speak at the church and you know the Zoom sessions and everything, and we've agreed that if we ever figure out time travel, <laughs> we're going to go back to the early 2000s and make sure that we meet a few years ahead of time <laughs> and make sure that we start going to the San Antonio UU. <laughs> oh, thank you. Because I feel bad that I missed out on so much of that. <laughs> Well, thank you to you all. And as usual, Art, you have stimulated a lot of thought and a lot of conversation. Um, much like you said, you've recommended books and I, now I want to run out and read them all. I don't know when, but <laughs> I certainly want to get the books and, and have them handy in case I ever get to it. But again, thanks to all of you. Uh, as we extinguish our chalice, I would remind you to hang on and we're going to have a short meeting after we finish here. And let me, let I'm me sorry. Close. Spirit of life, come on to me. Sing it by heart, all the story of the passion. Blow in the wind, rise in the sea, in giving life the shape of justice and roots of the Oh, you set me free. Thank you. I love that one too. All right. We extinguish this chalice flame, but dare to carry forward for the remainder of this week the vision of this free faith that justice, reason, and truth will prevail in this nation and on this planet. Help make it so. Amen.